Okay, is everyone ready? I think everyone's already buzzing and excited about this conversation. Hi everyone, I'm MJ, but now that we're all settling down, I just really would love to take a few moments to ground ourselves, if we can bring the energy down, ground ourselves, and really acknowledge the land that we gather on tonight. So on behalf of the Rethink team, we are incredibly grateful and honored to live and work on the traditional territory of several nations, including the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Chippewa, as well as the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples, which is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples today. This sacred land is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaties, signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. Both through our work and personally, we continue to listen and learn about all that has occurred in our history in order for us to be calling this place home. We honor and acknowledge with deep respect the history, the spirituality, the culture, and the wisdoms shared over millennia, and we stand in solidarity and allyship with the indigenous peoples of these lands and beyond for their fight for land, self-determination, and decolonization. Notes. Okay, so I'm MJ. I'm the founder of Rethink Breast Cancer, and I'm so excited and honored to see all of you in this room and that we're doing this event in person. Um, over the years, we've continued to hear about the huge need from people in the community to have this conversation, this very important conversation surrounding the topics of sex, body image, intimacy. This isn't our first rodeo, uh, but this is the first time we're doing this in person in a while, which feels so good. And uh, we're really excited about this conversation. I wanna thank um, our event sponsors for this evening. Several um, pharma partners have come on board. It's so important that they help support events like this because we all know that treatment for breast cancer is a big cause of some of these challenges. So I'd like to thank Gilead, Novartis, and Seattle Genetics, CGen, for their support. We also wanna give a huge shout out to Torrid for their support and sponsorship. They are a new partner and we are so excited to work with them and they have an amazing photo booth activation kind of right by the front door. So I hope everyone can grab some photos. I also wanna say a warm hug and a huge thank you to Pomp and Circumstance PR, our favorites, um, our friends and supporters and they really do so much for us uh, pro bono and really add they push, you know, push their contacts to do things for free for us, so it makes these kind of events that much more special. I think I just wanna say another huge thank you to Anna Ono, because we're so excited to partner with them on this event. We have uh, been wanting to do something for, with them for a number of years, and finally all the stars have aligned, and we're so excited. And um, with that, I'd like to inter introduce you to our moderator, and again, um, she and I have had the pleasure to get to know each other over the last few years. We've worked together on some pretty cool projects, and I'm really, really excited that she made the trip up to Canada to be here with us tonight. Over to you, Dana D'Onofre. Thank you all for um, having me. Thank you to the Rethink team and MJ for putting together such an incredible event and breaking a chair. Um, <laughs> I'm Dana Donafri. I'm the founder of Ana Ono Intimates. I'm based out of Philadelphia, but we service our community all around the world. Uh, we are chest inclusive lingerie, so we say two boobs, one boob, no boobs, or new boobs. We have you supported. So uh, we've got incredible uh, little space over there where you can fit and t touch and try. Um, we have one of our awesome stores in the Toronto area, my top drawer with Lisa back there in the back. She can raise her hand and wave. Uh, she's servicing the community, helping you all get uh, coverage through um, either the government aid uh, for breast prosthesis or through bras from your private insurance. So we'll tell you a little bit more about that later. I was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 27 uh, in 2010. So that was 13 years ago, and I've seen 40 years old now, so I'm very excited about that. <laughs> this topic tonight is, is so important and near and dear to my heart for so many reasons. Uh, when I was diagnosed in 2010, there wasn't organizations like Rethink or other people really stepping out and talking about the perspective of what it meant to go through breast cancer, face so many challenges in your life um, as a patient, but 
it's all of those pieces, the pieces of the puzzle that we have to put together afterwards, right? So when I had both of my breasts removed, my nipples were gone, my hair was gone, my eyebrows, eyelashes, as we all are too familiar in this room of what those feelings feel like, and nobody was talking about sex and body image and intimacy and feminine, you know, femininity and all of these other pieces. So I started speaking out about it uh, very early on in my cancer, uh, cancer career, <laughs> you call it that. <laughs> <laughs> feels like it and um, and my fiance my now husband at the time or my fiance at the time my now husband but he said to me he goes when are you gonna stop telling people about our sex life <laughs> and I said the second that somebody else starts because what was very difficult for me was creating Ana Ono was about feeling beautiful and sexy in my own skin but only being able to wear a sports bra so feeling anything less than that and if I couldn't love myself how was I going to love somebody else and I wanted the world to hear that story, not because it was painful or it was scary, because it was real. And so I'm so excited to see organizations and community members come out and have this really uh, difficult but inspiring conversation. And trust, we will open it up to questions later. So I hope you are all brave individuals in this room, because if you have a question, I'm sure 20 other people in this room have that same question. So don't be bashful um, or whisper it to the person next to you. And maybe they'll, say, they'll ask it for you. Um, so I am so honored to be on the, hosting this panel, co-hosting this panel with um, Rethink and these incredible, amazing uh, community leaders and members. So this uh, panelist, we'll start at the end here, is Dr. Kristen Rojas from um, Miami, Florida. She's a breast cancer surgeon and, gynecologic, um, and gynecologist uh, for a passion of sexual health and women's cancer survivorship. We have Dr. Kim Cullen, and she is a clinical and health psychologist and sex therapist. Um, she's here in the Toronto area, and she specializes as well in cancer. Next, we have Maha, and she's a Rethink Key collaborator and advocate with a lived experience through her breast cancer diagnosis and treatment. And last but not least, another Kim, and she's also a Rethink Key collaborator and advocate and is living with metastatic breast cancer. So thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate you dedicating your time and your expertise to us. So now, sex and body. I should have had you do that, Dr. Cullen, because you have a very sultry voice, so we could have, we could have had you do the entry. Um, so we, you know, I mentioned earlier, we've received a lot of questions in advance, so thank you all to submitted questions um, before the panel started. So keep in mind, we'll save all of the, the audience questions for the end, so please don't forget them, because they will be important. But before we get started, I would like to just ask you all a few questions, um, just for a little bit of a gauge in the room here. So with a show of your hands, um, who feels that they were educated by their health care team about the ways breast cancer would impact their sexual health? Crickets. We've got two in the back, <laughs> two in the way back. Um, yeah. <laughs> Cliff notes later. Um, who here has felt isolated or alone due to the way cancer has impacted their sexual health and body image? Okay. Mm hmm. You can put up two. We can see all limbs in the air. Who here feels that they had the support that they needed in terms of sexual health, intimacy, and body image? Okay, all right, we have a lot to cover tonight. All right, so we hear you, and this is why we are here, because these conversations matter. Um, so we're gonna jump right in, and I'm gonna start with you, Dr. Rojas, because I would like you to kind of walk us through a little bit of the science, right? We, we understand that these things are happening to us, but sometimes we just don't know why. Can you give us an overarching view as, as why our bodies, minds, and physicalities are, are changing after a diagnosis? Sure, can you hear me okay? All right, so thank you so much for having me here. I'm so honored to be with all of you and these amazing panelists and you as well. Um, so I think this is a really critical piece of information because I run this sexual health after cancer program in Miami called Music. Oftentimes patients get to me and they're like, nobody told me what, I don't even understand. They, don't, they haven't been told why this is happening. And I think as a society, we don't do a great job educating women about menopause in general. It's been almost a dirty word for so many years. I think that's changing now, but 
we're very ill-equipped to address these issues in young women. Um, so what happens? So there's a common misconception that estrogen receptor positive patients are the only ones affected by this. That's not true. So yes, patients with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer do get estrogen blockers, and that can cause menopausal symptoms because normal menopause is a gradual decline in estrogen because your ovaries stop making estrogen slowly. It's essentially a drug withdrawal. That's why you get hot flashes. Estrogen does a lot of good things. Estrogen receptor positive patients, we block that estrogen, put them immediately into menopause. But patients who get chemo also have similar symptoms because we're putting those patients into menopause as well. So I think it's a common misconception that it is only affecting certain women, but it's all related usually to estrogen. You have estrogen receptors in your heart, your brain, not only your vulva and vagina, but um, so it affects you in many different ways. So it's legit, right? We've just, <laughs> I feel so validated. <laughs> so it's not in our heads for those of you, which I'm sure, how many people have heard from their doctor, it's in your head? Okay, yeah, I'm with you there and that camp, literally been told that um, by cancer doctors. Um, so thank you again for the validation. Kim, let's kick it off with you because, you know, as patients, right, you're, you're still in treatment as a, as a stage four breast cancer patient. So your symptoms have come and gone and come back again. But why don't you share a little bit with us about, you know, how, how things have been affected to you through your treatment and, and what really surprised you the most? So, yeah, there's, there's never a point in time that any of my doctors brought up anything around sexual health. So it was always a focus on physical health, you know, symptoms, like physical symptoms from the chemo, um, mental health, but nobody ever talked about, you know, anything with sexual health. And so, you know, it's listed on one of the side effects, I think, on one of the sheets, you know, the chemo, but it's like way down at the bottom of the list, you know, and nobody actually even talks about it out loud and so you know vaginal dryness and loss of libido and you know and those are things that I wasn't expecting you know going through cancer in my 30s you know I'm like at the prime of my life I you know I had a pretty active sex life before cancer and so um, to be affected in that way it was just came as a shock and it felt really isolating to not having any of my doctors talking openly about it and nobody nobody in the community was even really talking much about it either um, so I really had to seek out a lot of that information on my own so Can you talk about when you were diagnosed, just so we can have a time frame? oh yeah so um, I was diagnosed uh, with stage 2 breast cancer in 2016 um, the day after my 34th birthday and then um, had a recurrence uh, nearly five years later in 2021 um, and it came back as stage four metastatic breast cancer. So um, I was diagnosed with hormone positive breast cancer to start and went through chemo and radiation and numerous um, breast cancer surgeries and then was on hormone therapy for many years and then um, went through uh, targeted therapy and chemo once I was re-diagnosed um, in 2021. And so I'm still on hormone therapy, or I'm on a, a Zolodex, like an uh, ovarian suppressor right now. And, uh, and so I'm still experiencing, you know, a lot of the, the same issues to this day. And so um, thankfully I have sought out a lot of the um, tools and resources that have kind of helped me through this second time going through this now. Um, and, you know, can talk more about that later, but, um, yeah, I'm just glad that we're having this conversation today. You said something really interesting when you said it's at the very bottom of the list on the, uh, the chemotherapy packet. And, and I remember in 2010, right, we didn't have digital access and information like we do today. And, and my nurse practitioner told me that I should wear a condom if I'm having sex with my fiance. And I was like, what? And she's like, well, you can transfer the chemo into your partner. And then I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm stopping you at wear a condom when you have sex with your partner because I'm on chemotherapy and you think I want to have sex with my partner? Like, stop right there. Um, anyways, I think I got laid once, but... Um, all right, so, 
So Maha, <laughs> um, why don't you tell us a little bit too about your um, cancer experience? Because I think it helps everybody, you know, kind of understand your point of view and, and the treatments that you've been on. But what what do you think that you wish you could have been told, and, and what was surprising you as as you were going into your treatments? Hi everyone. <laughs> okay, I'm not used to using a mic, so I'm going to try my best. But I was diagnosed in February 2018 with stage three C triple negative breast cancer. And like you, in my 30s, like I was pretty active in my sex life. And nobody ever tells you anything about like, if you're ever gonna have sex again. Um, I obviously didn't wanna have sex because I'm gonna be very blunt, I felt very gross and ugly. I lost all my hair, I didn't look like myself. But one thing that I think a lot of people don't speak about is losing your nipples. And you don't think about these things when you want to have sex again, and how do you get, like, 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 I don't even know where to start, like, nobody tells you anything about, like, how to feel or, or what emotions that you're going to be going through, despite the dryness of your vagina, like, when I had to go to the bathroom, I'm very, uh, there's no filter with me, so I'm going to be very <laughs> blunt today, um, <laughs> um, like, I didn't even know like that when I was gonna go pee that it's gonna hurt because of the dryness. So that's when I like went to my gynecologist and I'm like, um, I think there's something wrong with me. So, sorry, back forward, I actually had an oophorectomy because I'm BRCA2. So that shot me to full blown menopause and so I don't have ovaries. So it's, it's really dry down there. <laughs> um, so I basically went to the doctor and I said, um, my vagina hurts and it's really dry and what the hell do I do? Like, you guys didn't tell me what I'm supposed to do with myself. This is exactly what happened in the doctor's office. The doctor brought out a dildo and said, and they're different sizes and they said, you just have to practice with yourself. I'm like, oh, okay, so what about my dryness? And then she just gave me a lot of samples. And I'm like, this is, this, is, this is not right. So I feel like as a young person, very active, like you already feel like, S-H-I-T, I don't know if I can say it in camera, you already feel awful about yourself. And to have to go through all this stuff, you, we shouldn't have to worry about sex. We should feel like we should be able to do this still. And it's just, it's, it's a lot having to deal with trying to survive and then being worried about feeling like crap and then not feeling loved. Well, I, you gave me the perfect segue because I, it's obviously very physical, right? What we're dealing with is medically induced in most cases. But, you know, Dr. Kalen, I'd, I'd love for you to touch on, you know, what is happening in our heads as well? Because we know that this is mental and physical um, because of the way that we feel. Um, the things that we've been told, the experiences that we're having. So can you just give us a little bit of your medical point of view on, you know, what, what's happening upstairs? Because to fix our downstairs, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> well, and I think that's where the it's in your head sentiment gets a bad rap, that it's often said in an invalidating way, right? And it, it invalidates everything else that's going on. But one of the first things that I share with my clients is the idea that the brain is the biggest sex organ. And so it's in our body and our head. Um, and I think one of the problems or one of the things that, that, uh, that gets in the way of things being perhaps discussed um, as much as I'd like them to be is that like there is a focus on sexual function and, and that's important, changes in the body. And yet there is too much of a focus on functionality. And so there's a lot going on in the head, if you will, with respect to how am I adjusting to not just changes in my sexual functioning, how am I adjusting to changes in my body, how I look, how I relate to my body? And this occurs a lot of different stages coming out of the identity of being patient and reconnecting with the body uh, in a context of like safety and healing. And so I could probably go way over my minute and a half when it comes to in the head. And it's really about an individual way that we relate to our body, to ourselves, to our sexual selves, to our feminine self, our masculine self, and also with our partners. And so a lot of the work that I do is working with women and couples to help 
navigate and adjust to changes and changes that are permanent in many ways. Yeah, I could listen to this for hours. So I was like, I'm like, yeah, keep going. You know, I, I think you said something really important. Um, it's, it's said in a dismissive way, right? So I think when we are patients inside the doctor room, there is a lot of gaslighting that happens uh, con con constantly, really. Um, I think especially to young women, uh, probably, and I'm not gonna say more than older women because I know that they also have the same issue. But, you know, they look at us as healthy, young individuals, even though we're dealing with these, you know, age, you know, ageist sort of issues like menopause at 27, 24, you know, 30 years old. So, Dr. Rojas, when you're encountering these patient moments, and we're very, very lucky to have two female medical professionals on this panel, PS, by the way, amazing, but not every one of us get the luxury to speak with a female doctor. Um, so, so how do you approach the patients, hear them, listen, validate them? So for those of us that might be encountering sort of the negative side in, in the physician's office, what, what we can be equipped to do to make sure that we're advocating for ourselves in the right way so they hear us. This is um, always a reality check and very disheartening when I hear patient perspectives. Um, so when we started the sexual health after cancer program, it was just me and a scheduler and in Miami, and we were like, okay, let's see how this goes down here. And we immediately had like 300 people on the waiting list. They, the schedulers were booking appointments into 2025, and it was 2022. And I was like, okay, stop, we can't do that to people. <laughs> like, that's not okay. So as an institution, we recognized that it was helpful for everyone at our cancer center to say, okay, this is a really big problem, it's under address. I already knew that, but you know, you need the people with the checkbooks to understand that too. So we, our team grew, and now we have, the way that we approach it is, you know, there's a lot to get through in the first visit, especially when I'm wearing my breast surgeon hat. You know, that first visit, we've gotta go through a lot of information. So the way I'm promoting programs like this to other providers is to say, hey, um, maybe not the very first visit, but someone should contact the patient, follow up with them and say, hey, we have these other resources. If you experience anything like this, let us know. Um, so you don't have to go all the way into it, but just let them know, hey, we're here if, we ne if you need us. But one really important piece of information is that, you know, when a patient, it's a male patient's diagnosed with prostate cancer, mm -hmm. they are told that they're going to have erectile dysfunction, more than 50% of them on that first visit. It oftentimes goes into the treatment plans that are made for these patients. And like events like this where we're talking about it are huge, but also I want to empower all of you, like even bring it up to everyone on your care team. Because even if you say, hey, hello, we haven't talked about this and it's a big deal, and your oncologist gets super flustered and like looks really embarrassed and doesn't help you at all, if five patients ask that question that day, they're gonna go home, like everyone's human, they're gonna go home, put those resources together for you and patients like you, and we're gonna do a better job. More events like this, the industry is gonna start to respond as well. There's five types of generic Viagra on the market, but only two FDA approved meds for, for women, so we can talk about that later, but I'm, I don't wanna to talk too much. But yeah, so that, those are my thoughts. <laughs> uh, Dr. Kalin, uh, Maha said something uh, I think really, really important and something I've always really advocated for, like the loss of the nipples, right? Uh, nipples are a sexual organ and we don't talk about them as if they are, and, and a lot of patients that have to decide what surgeries they're gonna go into, and, and based upon like losing a sexual organ, how would that influence the choice that you are actually making when you go into the room? So thinking about the upstairs, controlling the downstairs, when you, you know, don't have the nipples, or if that was your se sexual organ that can no longer be utilized, like how, how do you encourage patients to work through that and, and find new and interesting ways to you know, find their own arousal. Yeah, and again, this again comes down to right, the prioritization of function versus what? Fashion, extra, right? That like pleasure, yeah. pleasure is function. And I think there's such a, a devaluing of that, of the role that, that breasts and nipples can play, not for everyone, but for, for, for many women, men alike. Um, and so a lot of the work that I do is, combination of 
grief and acceptance. And I'm always careful when I use the word acceptance because that can feel really gross and su suck it up in this. Um, but the first part is just grieving this sense of loss um, and creating space for that. Um, because again, it is sort of a devaluing, like it's an extra, it's a jewelry and not really kind of talked about um, in the medical profession with respect to its implications on sex and pleasure. Um, and how I go about it was exactly your last point is learning to or being curious about different areas of pleasure. And I think the other thing with losing nipples is that it's not just that we are losing sensation, but oftentimes we are adding discomfort or nerve pain or negative sensations or pain, physical and emotional discomfort. And so a lot of what we do is exploring different areas of pleasure. And that could be around the chest, that could be exploring different erogenous zones. Um, I encourage you all to Google the word sensate focusing. It's one of the like best techniques and fun things um, in, in sex therapy. I just call it mindful touching. And really what it means is just exploring different areas of pleasure. And the way that I sort of rationalize that or, or the piece that I add to that is, while it really sucks that we are in this position where we have to explore different forms of pleasure, it also creates a new opportunity to explore different areas um, of pleasure that you may not have known is there. But again, right, that doesn't mean that we're also minimizing the grief, so it really is a balance. I keep hoping mine's like the back of my kneecap or something, like <laughs> something weird that nobody would touch. That's why I haven't found it yet. But um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna Google that. It actually falls on the list of erogenous zones. So check hey, it out. <laughs> telling the hubby. Uh, so Maha, I think you talked a little bit about this earlier. You mentioned you know the, the dildos that your doctor gave you as an experience, and you know whether they were dilators or dildos. I don't know how, how many people have sort of been given that option in a doctor's office. The, the dilator story, um, even though they can't do an exam on you, which I also think is kind of funny. Um, I call them like survivor slash patient hacks. I'm sure you have some because, you know, I've, I've gotten a little bit behind the curtain with Ma on the sex life. How, what, what have you done to sort of start solving some of your own problems um, in the bedroom that you could share that might be um, interesting for other people to explore? Let's get spicy. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, honestly, for myself, it's about self-love. Um, I start focusing on my health better. I feel like if I start to feel better about myself, it's really about yourself and loving yourself first. We, we are, we're going through so much. We lost body parts. We lost like things that used to pleasure us. What the hell am I going to do with myself? I was telling myself. So as you guys all see my tattoos on my breast, I, I, it started making me feel sexy, I don't know. I did that, I didn't get any nipples, I'm like, F it, I don't have nipples, so what am I gonna do with myself? So I decided to get tattoos and, and it felt, made me feel good. It might not be for everybody, but it made me feel good and then I started going to the gym. I live in the gym now, <laughs> it's my second home. But it's, it's where, like, it's like my safe space and I get to clear my head, nobody bothers me there and I just started to feel good about myself and I get to dance again, and I get to have sex, lots of sex again. But regarding what you were saying earlier about just finding ways to satisfy yourself, that's where I'm at. And that's how it started to help me. And it's all really in here. Because in the beginning, after I lost my breast and everything, like I said, I felt like crap. But it's really in here. Sometimes you just have to imagine things, and it's just gonna happen. Maybe just don't think too much, but it's just going to happen. And for me, that's just how it started happening again. Kim, what about you? So a lot of like what I have found, um, and it's kind of long lines of what uh, Dr. Colin was saying, is like redefining what intimacy looks like for us, and even just you know for myself too. Um, so you know, finding. I think, like, because one of the big things, um, yeah, I, I used to get, like, really, you know, stressed out any time I would think about even having sex. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm just going to be in pain. It's going to be uncomfortable. I'm not even going to enjoy it, you know. And, um, but then I, I, like, let my guard down a bit, and it was, like, when I was talking to the sex therapist, it was, like, you know, stop kind of thinking too much about it. And, you know, I guess... 
I don't want to say like lowering my expectations, but like, but not expecting to like, you know, always climax and not expecting like to always have to have, you know, penetration or, you know, like it was doing other things, you know, like whether that was oral sex or, you know, just like playing together and a lot of, you know, foreplay and, and figuring out, yeah, where the, you know, erogenous zones were and stuff. And, um, you know, we just kind of uh, like came up with this like toolkit, I feel like, of like, you know, sex toys and, you know, reading um, like uh, erotica and stuff like that, you know. So um, there's like a lot of different things that we really um, focused on instead. And, um, and then one of the big things like Maha was saying too is just like really learning to um, accept myself and like, um, accept my body again because for my husband and I, you know, um, nipple play and like, you know, touching my breasts was like a big part of our sex life. And so um, it took me a long time to kind of accept my new body and, you know, I'd reconstructed breasts and just wasn't comfortable with myself. And then, um, and then, you know, one day I was like shopping for bras and I was like, you know, I deserve to feel sexy and like wear sexy lingerie and, and, um, and I booked myself a boudoir shoot one day and, you know, I was like so nervous at first and then by the end of it, I, you know, got my boobs out and, you know, and loud and proud and, you know, that was really a game changer for me. And so um, I think that's really important and, you know, a good thing I highly recommend is, you know, if you do get a chance like do a boudoir shoot and I think everybody just deserves to feel sexy and... So as we pass the mic down to Dr. Rojas, I think um, my best survivor hack, uh, and you'll probably yell at me for this because my gyno did, I lived off of coconut oil, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, then, but then they told me, they're like, don't because it has like live somethings in it. And so then I went to EVO, extra virgin olive oil is a good backup. I don't know if that's still okay or not. But, but the reason was because I could, the lubricants all had too much ingredients in them and, we, in, and with the atrophy and everything else, there was like infection after infection after infection. So you had, I had to find something organic or, or real. And um, so from the gyno side of your experience in practice, um, for those that are estrogen positive, can't have some of the replacements, can't use some of the creams or aren't recommended or suggested to do that, what are those life hacks um, to deal with the dryness and the atrophy and some of those other issues? Thank you. I'm going to actually give you a counterpoint. No, not at all. Um, okay, so the biggest, most common symptoms patients have when they come to the music sexual health after cancer program is dryness and painful sex and low desire. But dryness and painful sex go together. So we have a four-step algorithm. Number one is eliminating irritants. Okay, so you don't even realize it, but there's artificial fragrances, long name chemicals in the detergent you wash your underwear with, in the bath bombs. Um, and so the first, especially if you're having stinging with urination or burning or that feeling, so first step is back off everything. Really take an inventory of everything is touching the vulva, which is the outside, or the vagina. Um, number two, my go-to is single ingredient organic coconut oil. It acts as an emollient. <laughs> It has wow. natural antimicrobial and antifungal properties. We're huge proponents, but when we have the moisturization talk, it's gonna be, think of it, moisturizers for maintenance, lubricants for love. So they're two different products. They have two different functions. So you put your eye cream on at night, or you're brushing your teeth. Hopefully everyone brushes their teeth at least once a day. You're going to take a little bit of coconut oil and the external vulva and go to sleep. That's like the first step because it protects the skin while it starts to heal. Um, and it can get inside. A lot of suppositories are based in coconut oil. They're completely safe. But so is olive oil. But I just like the idea of coconut oil better. And then so once that stinging has gone away, we bump them up to a hyaluronic acid moisturizer. So those come in suppositories. Good brands are bona fide. They can be cost limiting. CVS, which is a pharmacy, I don't know if you all have CVS here, but there are some generics of hyaluronic acid suppositories. So it's the same stuff in your under eye cream takes uh, moisture from the environment, holds it on the skin. So I have patients use those like three times a day, three times a week, excuse me. Um, then, so separate from lubricants, so everyone, from now on, you choose the lubricant. Your partner does not get to pick the whatever cheapest thing they find at the gas station, <laughs> okay? <laughs> like, 
you are gonna pick it. You should only be using water-based lubricants if you're depending on condoms for STD or pregnancy protection. Silicone-based lubricant, you have to find something that's as slippery as possible because friction's gonna cause more irritation. So you wanna find something, and I was so happy to see Uberlube out there. That's our go-to in music. So Uberlube has like no, none of the extra stuff. You don't want warming, you don't want flavors, you don't want scents. Um, and then we address the step four is addressing the pelvic floor. So we do bring in dilators for patients after we fix the dryness. But we have a video for that that we show them so we're not just throwing them this phallic thing and saying, hey, go do this. Because um, it can be really stressful. And there's a lot of like techniques. It's not just about stretching the tissues. It's also about relaxing the muscles because you've had so many probably painful episodes. Um, one quick thing about hormones. I know we're supposed to limit to a minute. So actually, I'm a huge proponent of vaginal hormones even for estrogen receptor positive patients. The studies in the past that showed that there was an increase in, in estrogen in your blood using vaginal estrogen, which is different from a pill or a patch, used doses five times higher than what we use today. So I'll take patients, have them on a hyaluronic acid moisturizer, and then if they, for a few months, if they still have symptoms, I'll add back a super low dose estrogen cream once a week. There's no way that increases your serum estradiol. Um, we have no good evidence showing it increases the risk of recurrence. That's my go-to for patients on tamoxifen or who have triple negative. For patients on aromatase inhibitors, we have vaginal DHEA. It's a cousin of testosterone. It works right there for FDA approved for painful sex. So there's androgen receptors in the vulva that it specifically targets. So patients with persistent pain, the brand name in the United States is Interosa. I think it's available in Canada because I was trying to look up what's available here. There's an alliance trial showing that patients on aromatase inhibitors, letrozole, eczemestane, and astrozole, who use vaginal DHEA every single night do not have an increase of estrogen in their body. So we're giving it to patients once or twice a week for a few months while they get back into the swing of things. There's no way it increases your risk of recurrence. So I'm a huge proponent. It's a long discussion. But um, yeah, those are my thoughts. So, so Dr. Cullen, um, that's, that's amazing, um, Dr. Rojas, for just very, very real tips. Um, what about the lack of desire? How do, we, how do we work through that? So lack of desire is, is a good one in that it's difficult and complex, but also there's a lot of different ways to come at it. Um, I think that, of course, there can be a physiological, biological component to lack of desire. A lot of, if I could quantify it and just estimate, I would probably say about 50-50 with respect to the psychological piece. So a lot of women that will come to my office or couples, a big part of the lack of desire has come from an association of sex being painful. So of course we're not gonna have much of a desire to have something that has been painful, uncomfortable, or even just not enjoyable, right? Um, and lack of desire is also associated with like other stuff going on in life, in addition to recovery and balancing all areas of life. And so one of the conversations I actually have is this idea of this expectation that desire should be spontaneous. And this is probably one of the main tips or one of the main points of information that I would share. We have this idea that spontane uh, desire should be spontaneous. We're doing the dishes, we have a sexy thought, and we're ready to go. <laughs> and that, that's not to say that that can't happen, but in my experience with respect to the sexual response model, desire will usually come after some sort of arousal or cue. Right, and that could be a thought, that could be a suggestive little touch from a partner, that could be a scent, but it's not until we feel like a little tingle or something that might actually cue the desire. And so what I share with women is that doesn't mean to go have sex in a way that is like completely crossing your own boundary or you're really not into it, but to sort of think about the idea that like, has there ever been, ever been a time where um, cancer notwithstanding, like you haven't really been in the mood, but then you had sex and like, yeah, it was kind of fun anyways, you, you're excited, like you're happy that you did it. Again, this is not an overall like go and do it anytime you're not in the mood, but it is something important to think about. Um, there's two books out there that I would definitely recommend. The main one is um, Better Sex Through Mindfulness. Um, and this is really a focus on kind of the body and the pleasurable sensations um, in the moment. Thank you for all of those incredible tips. Um, Maha, we're gonna unpack something a little bit serious. You touched on it a little bit earlier, but you, you, you said about self-care. Um, 
Tell us how you feel like your treatment and your surgeries impacted your body image. Where do I start? <laughs> you gotta be quick, because we're gonna open up for questions, so. I don't even know where to start, to be honest. For me, I feel like it was really like, it's not even the physical aspect of it for me, it's just like my emotion kind of took over everything. It's because you live in the survival mode that you just want to live, and then after you're like, okay, so you got reconstruction done, you have all these tattoos done, and my, this also, I'll be honest, this also affected my marriage because as I'm sure it has with yours if you're like married or have a significant other, it's really hard to, to be sexual with someone who ended up being your caregiver, for me anyways. Um, so I really needed to really just kind of like be by myself and really just take care of me and just do me and love myself again. So now I just love myself. Like, I feel like I don't wait on anybody. I travel on my own. I do things for myself. I imagine things to get aroused, as you say, because it, for me, it helps me a lot because, unfortunately, I don't have any more nimbles. And that was a big part of my sexual life as well. And it's, it's really just about loving yourself, really. What about you, Kim? Because I know that you've been married for a long time. And um, you know, you've been in and out of treatment for the last few years, so how is that affecting you and, and your body image? It's definitely been hard, because um, you know, it's not even just about uh, you know, losing my breasts, it's also losing my hair multiple times, and you know, having to look at myself in the mirror and you just this completely raw, stripped down version of yourself, and there's, there's nothing to hide behind, no hair, no nothing, right? And, um, you know, you have people looking at you, and so you just, yeah, it's been, it's been really hard, but um, I think one of the biggest things, like I was saying before, was like really allowing myself to be, you know, to feel sexy again, you know, and buying myself, you know, nice lingerie and, you know, like some I don't know pieces, you know. Thanks, and Kim. Exactly, got a little plug there, but. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, just being able to look at myself in the mirror, like actually one of the most empowering experiences I was shopping um, for bikinis and I'm sure other people had the same experience, like shopping for bras, shopping for bikinis and nothing's fitting. And, and I went into this one change room at this one store and they had post-it notes all over the mirror and it was saying, you know, like just like all like, you know, love yourself and, you know, like you're beautiful and and that really stuck with me and, you know, I do have some around my mirror now and sometimes, you know, sometimes I still have those days where I just need to kind of repeat those things in my head, you know, just to, because it can be, it can be hard some days. I mean, you know, I, I'm still going through it and I still have my days and, um, you know, it's a work in progress, so. Yeah, and uh, definitely we're ready for like a TMI moment here, but, um, you know, I, I want to touch on a little bit for, for the single ladies, all oh, the single ladies. Um, Maha, you talked about a little bit being hard on a marriage, and uh, my husband and I, we separated uh, mostly because of the sexual dysfunction in our relationship, and, um, and I figured if I was going to go out there, I was going to have a little fun. So what I would do is I would pick one of two paths. I would either uh, tell the fine person I was speaking to at the bar that I didn't have any nipples. <laughs> and then, you know, see if they ran or see if they were more inquisitive. Um, or I wouldn't, and then I'm like, hmm, they're trying to find them. <laughs> they're not there. <laughs> so, don't be so afraid of it either, you know? Like, it's, you know, it gave me like sort of this liberating moment to say, is it me? Is it my, is it my upstairs or my downstairs? Is it a combination of both? Um, but that's how I amused myself, nonetheless. Um, so, you know, thinking about being in relationships, seeking out partners, being single, being young, midlife, late life, whatever, whatever that really is. Um, Dr. Colin, what about relationships like how when we're sort of dealing with all these super complex issues and we're identifying our body image and you know all these sexual dysfunction things how do you how do you even go about you know 
finding somebody that you want to be with or want to spend your time with after all of this? Well, I think the first step, which I think we've really covered, is this idea of learning to love yourself and reconnect with yourself. Um, I sort of have this kind of model that I work through with women, and one is, again, reconnecting with the self as a sense of just safety and non-medicalization and reconnecting with the self and building confidence, reconnecting with the sensual self and then the sexual self. Um, and finding a partner is, is not unlike finding a partner without cancer, but there are more implications, right? And so one of the things that I often say is really trying to find this balance in knowing that you'll probably never fully feel 100% ready, but going along that line when you feel just ready enough and you might be out there and think you're ready and then realize you weren't quite ready and that's okay, right? There is a little bit of experimentation even with like the nipple talk, right? Um, another question that often comes up a lot is like, what about disclosure? Like when and how, how do I say this thing? And one thing that comes up is like, more times than not, depending on what kind of a TMI person you are, like on a first date, we are not sharing our entire life history, our entire life traumas. And so it can also be a series of disclosures. You can also, right, turn in to trust your own intuition with respect to gauging, is this someone that I feel comfortable and safe with now and at this time? And I think I'll end with one piece that really gets under addressed is, right, we often talk about disclosures and dating like we are partner hunting. Right? And what that means is looking for a partner or dating in service of finding a partner. And that's all well and fine. And yet, if we're not there yet, or if we are just out and having casual sex, we should absolutely be able to do that. And so those conversations can be a little more, I don't want to quite use the word tricky, but there is a bit more experimentation, I think, in terms of seeing what happens if you disclose and how you disclose or if you don't. Um, and I think it does take a little bit of practice and, and gaining information um, about how you feel in these moments. So get your questions ready. I'm going to come around here, but I'm going to end this with Dr. Rojas because um, we've talked about the doctor's office and how complicated it is and, and what we're learning when we go. What's your advice or insight? Um, at which point should we bring our partners with us or should we really try to do this alone or you know what advice would you have of, of bringing a partner with you to these appointments and, and having these tough conversations two-on-one? -on -one? Uh, can I just add something to the desire piece first and then answer that? So I'm so glad you're here because you're tackling all the things that like I can't answer sometimes. So um, one more piece about the desire because that comes after fixing the pain is you know we tell patients there's some really good resources Rosie app is by a gynecologist um, and, if, and it's for patients with low desire. One of the tips on there is to schedule sex, which sounds super lame because it's not spontaneous desire, but if you're someone who's become kind of averse to like, oh, are they gonna ask, is it, is it gonna happen today? Is it gonna happen today? You start to have this like avoidant behavior. If you're like, oh no, it's happening on Saturday, you're off the hook the rest of the week, but you're also <laughs> free to like prepare. So you're gonna start thinking about it. So there's two uh, other resources we give patients and they're basically like audio porn. Um, so it's like when you're getting ready, what you listen to. It's Dipsy and Quinn. Um, they're the two podcasts for that. And then last, so there's all this non-pharmacologic stuff, but there are two FDA-approved medications for low desire and FDA-approved for premenopausal patients. One is flibanserin, which is a once-a-day pill. You can't drink a lot of alcohol with it, so if you drink more than two drinks, you want to skip your pill that day. Other benefits are that you sleep better and it may help you lose weight. Um, works in the brain, it's not hormonal. Second one is bremelanotide, that is an injection you give yourself in the abdomen prior to sexual activity. It's a super hard sell with cancer patients. I haven't actually <laughs> prescribed it. But we do flibanserin a lot. So I give it to patients who are on aromatase inhibitors after we fix the pain. And I'd say like 60 to maybe 50 to 60% of patients report that it helps a little bit, like get the engine going. And then last thing is Ann Partridge from Dana-Farber told me it's not foreplay, it's five play. Mm -hmm. And so like that was, I think, a helpful thing to tell yeah. partners who are kind of clueless. But um, <laughs> so when to, um, what was the question again? Bring oh, your partners. Bring your partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and one yeah. minute. One minute. No, I can do it in less. 
it's basically up to you. But I think that oftentimes partners want to help. I'm not the best person to answer that aspect of, but I think often they want to help. So we say in music, like they can be there the first visit. We have them out of the room for the exam. So we can also kind of just talk one on one for a few. But I have seen from my doctor experience that partners really want to know, like, why is this happening? It really kind of like takes the pressure off you, validates everything you've been saying that it's not in your head. And so we oftentimes may not even have them there for the first visits, but for the follow-ups by telemed, we'll have them like listening in. And I think it gives them a lot of perspective. It puts a medical reason for these things, you know? It takes, I think, some of the pressure off them and, oh, it's not me. It's these medications. There's a physiologic reason for this. So those <clears throat> amazing. Thanks for letting me answer both questions. Of course, yes. Uh, any questions out in the, the crowd here? Oh, here, I'm just going to bring the mic so uh, it's, so they can hear you in the video. <laughs> just, what was the name of the pill he, she mentioned? It's Flibanserin. Uh, F -L -I Spell it. <laughs> F-L-I-B-A-N-S-E-R-I-N. -S -S -E the brand name is Addy, A-D-D-Y-I. You can actually get prescribed this from the website. You can do like a telemedicine mm -hmm. if your doctor doesn't know much about it. When it came out, there was a black box warning saying you couldn't drink any alcohol. Like even to be a prescriber, I had to do like a special training saying that I would tell patients you cannot have a sip of alcohol, which is absolutely ridiculous because like Viagra, most people know if you drink a lot on Viagra, you're gonna pass out. Um, but like no one gives a black box warning for that. And, but we can talk, I can do like a whole talk on that. Um, so, so you can just more than two drinks. You don't take your pill that day, skip your pill that day. I have patients take it at night in case, it's a, in case it makes you a little sleepy. Um, yep. Any questions? Okay. Since I'm here. Um, <laughs> yeah, so seconding the nipple thing, it is so freaking annoying. I still have nipples, but they don't do anything. And it is so depressing. Anyways, um, my question is, any tips on getting a partner who we, has never used lube in their lifetime, and me, who's never used lube in my lifetime, to embrace using lube and not think it's their fault, that they can't, that, that we need it. Yeah, that's actually a, a, a common conversation that I have with couples is how do we incorporate things like lube, toys, moisturizers, um, even kind of aids with respect to positioning. And the one thing I often say is there are so many times and, and couples, individuals that are incorporating this recreationally, if you will, right? Lube is a good time. And so I think that com right, communication is key and I think that's sort of a way to look at it. And I think it does get a little sort of muddy when we're doing something because we have to do something, but then that also kind of limits the ability or the possibility of doing something, yes, because we have to do something, but also that it could end up being like a really good time and open us up to a lot of different experiences. And so those are the types of conversations um, that I have with couples and kind of encourage women to have with their partners. Um, but it really does come to sort of, I always say communication is the bridge back to sex. Um, and that's you sort of knowing your partner as to how you'd introduce it. But that, that's the way that I frame it. I tell everyone to use silicone-based lubricant, like no matter what, yeah. like just forever, for the rest of your life. Like, um, and I think uh, some ways to frame it are like, you can maybe have less irritation afterwards, like so you're more likely to engage more often or engage for longer because oftentimes patients who don't have lubricants, they have to stop early and then it's kind of like, so I would frame it kind of in that way. Um, yeah. yeah. Any lube advice from the patients? on the stage? I feel like for me, I do it on a regular. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to have sex to do it. Like I always do it on a daily basis, that's what I'm supposed to do. So when it comes, I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you can follow that, Kim, but give it I a know. shot. I know, what do I even say <laughs> after that? <laughs> oh man. Um, I do follow though, because uh, Dr. Rojas, I remember I was actually listening one time. You were, I think it was on um, uh, Nally and Stephanie's podcast. Yeah, exactly, on Cyber Talks. And you talked about incorporating the coconut oil as like part of like the like daily ritual. And so that's something that I've done now on, on a regular basis. So I'm like, okay, I go with it. It's just like one of my steps now that I do. And, 
And I use the, um, what is it, the Uber lube? Is that what, what is it? No, I use a, the Uber Lube. That, yeah, that one's a really good one, yeah. And that's all I got. If I can ask a follow-up question to the Lube conversation and then ask my question, um, is it bad to use coconut, the coconut oil as a lube? Yeah, so oils can degrade latex condoms. So if you're using... I don't, yeah, yeah, so no just as a disclaimer. Um, I think that the best lubricant is the, soup, is the most slippery thing because you want to decrease friction. So the oils, while they can be helpful, may not be the most slippery product. Okay. Uh, and my question is, even though we may have supportive partners and, you know, um, caring and respectful of our limits, I'm wondering what other tools, like whether it's a book, a film, something that we can use to engage with our partners to again have them realize that it's not in our head and that this is a, 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 you know, a challenge that we might have every time we engage in intimate moments. Mm -hmm. I think it's easy for them to forget sometimes, especially if they haven't been there through the actual cancer journey. Um, so books, I like, is therapy the way to go for, you know, to sort of have that open dialogue? I feel like I'm sort of a broken record in terms of, like, I need foreplay. I can't just jump into it. <laughs> I feel like I need foreplay. I can't just jump into it should be <laughs> the motto that all <laughs> particularly cishet men partners need to know, right? Foreplay is five play. Foreplay is not the coming attractions. It should be part of the main feature. And that's one of the conversations that I have that we're not using foreplay to replace penetrative sex, that foreplay is part of the sex. It is the sex in itself. And so to your question, absolutely. So there is a book that I've displayed out there called Sex Woman Cancer or something to that impact. You can go take a picture of it. That's a really good one. Um, the Canadian Cancer Society, if you Google Canadian Cancer Society, Sex, Intimacy, and Cancer, they have a really wonderful booklet. It's not specific to, to breast cancer. It, it, it covers a lot of different cancers, but it includes a lot of information there. And one of the things that I like about that book, in part because I'm the one who plugged to put that in there, is that in addition to the physical aspects and changes with sex, it also addresses and has information about body image, self-esteem, et cetera. And there's just something about putting it in a medical model that can help make it a bit more, I don't know, believable, convincible in terms of sharing that information. Another one that I really like, if you Google, you can come to me, I'd have to search it myself, but I believe it's Alberta Health Science Center. They have a really good um, a sexual health clinic out there, but they have a good website that provides a lot of different information. So those would be sort of my go-tos with respect to providing and getting that information. Canadian Cancer Society, if you Google that, plus uh, sex intimacy and cancer, um, it's there. And I believe I have a handout out there and I believe I, I referenced it as, as one of the helpful resources. Time for one last question. Any burning questions? Not the dry vagina kind, but. Uh, so mine is, it's, I just wanted to ask really quickly on top of the lube question. Um, you said you prefer silicone based, but then Earlier you said water-based, so could you just clarify that? Yeah, so water-based lubricants, they have different properties. So water-based, um, you have to reapply them more often. Sometimes they're stickier, but they don't like stain the sheets, whereas silicone-based lubricants stay slippier, slipperier for longer, um, but they could stain the sheets. And if you like, I tell my like older ladies, like if you get on the floor, you have to clean it up because you'll like break a hip or something. <laughs> <laughs> it stays slippery for freaking ever. And then Uber Loop, yeah. So, but the water base, like everyone's really into using water base because I guess it's like the most common brands, but they're not the best products. But sometimes you might want to use them because Uber Loop is only compatible with one type of condom. It's on their website. I think it's the polyurethane, but I don't want yeah, but to, but you can check their website. Um, but water-based is like safe for silicone toys, so it's good to have a water-based on hand so you have it for toys. Okay, did that change anybody's mind to ask one more question? All right, oh, hang on, we've got it. Last one coming. I actually have a question for you. 
sorry. And I don't mean to get too personal, and please speak however comfortably, but you touched on the fact that your relationship disintegrated, uh, imploded, whatever. Um, how did you get over that mentally? And I, as a single person, I need to understand exactly how you went about dating again. <laughs> <laughs> and this might be an offline conversation. <laughs> yes, we can definitely offline. Um, I, I will say I, I am very lucky. My, my partner and I, we reconciled a few years after our separation, um, which was great for the both of us. I was diagnosed at 27 years old, three months before our planned wedding. Our entire relationship was my cancer. Um, so for us, it was like a breath of fresh air between the both of us. But dating part was fun. We can definitely offline about that. Because um, I needed that too. I needed to feel desirable and wanted. And you said it earlier, how do you have sex with somebody who's caring for you? Um, and I think that that was a really difficult, difficult piece. But, you know, with so many friends of mine that are, you know, dating and trying to navigate singlehood, you know, while dealing with all of this, I think, I think it gets really tricky, right? Like, we have to expose a lot of ourselves very early, um, uh, and depending on your surgery. You know, I, I can't say, I, I guess I don't hear the gripes from women that have had lumpectomies, as much of those of us that have lost our breasts or have stayed flat or only have one, you know, one breast because we have to express ourselves in this way with all of the emotional pieces. But, you know, it's, it's, I think relationships are just hard. I mean, my story is I sat on my gynecology, my, my gyno's table because my, my atrophy was so bad um, and it had been for years. We probably hadn't had sex for three or four years. And I sat there crying saying, this has ruined my life. This has now ruined my marriage. It's taken everything from me. And I still was just getting a pat on the back. You're a cancer patient now. This is your life now. We're so sorry, but these things happen. And I was like, this is not okay, this is not enough. And I kept seeking out doctor after doctor after doctor until I found one female doctor that gave me the pathway through a lot of what you're doing in your treatment. And when she told me she could fix me, I had a total meltdown because I was like, I've been hearing for eight years I'm unfixable. And now you're giving me a pathway. For, I was like, I'm willing to do whatever I need to do. you know. So I think it's really hard because we rely on our physicians to help guide us, but in so many ways, they only have the tools that are available to them. They have old studies that are telling them that estrogen is bad for us and they're not giving it to us in prescriptions. And then, so we have to kind of get through these barriers on our own, which is not the right way to do it, right? So, um, but yeah, let's talk about dating because I have more funny stories. <laughs> Those were the PC ones I said earlier. So, um, Paul doesn't watch these things, so I don't have to tell him to not tune in. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is really great. Thank you all for, for being so open and honest and transparent and, and sharing so much amazing advice and so much of your experiences. Uh, so just to close this out, we're going to ask you a few more questions. Uh, so raise your hand if you feel more educated about the ways breast cancer can impact your body. Okay, rethink. All right, all right. Uh, raise your hand if you feel validated and less isolated in your experience with sex and body after a breast cancer diagnosis. Oh, I'm going to cry. <laughs> and raise your hand if you feel like you have the tools and support you'll need to improve your sexual health and body image moving forward. Yay! Everybody give each other a round of applause. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you to Rethink, the team at Rethink. And have some fun!